yourself? Alright, we'll chill out, but yeah. It's more here. Right? <laughs> There's no so, snow. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> so currently we're standing on the buoy deck. So right now we have actually one of our twenty thousand pound weights. Uh, all these buoys here. Twenty thousand? Yeah. We're held by this. We get this in the water by our nice here. crane operating system. What's the way for? So that's just to keep the buoy in place. Uh, oh, okay. Since, yeah, the Great Lakes have a uh, natural current. Yeah. 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 20,000 pounds of county thing. Really make sure. So when you lift this from that boat and you get it over here, that old ship really tilts. Yeah. It does. Like, I can take a pound of the floor. Oh, yeah. foot buoy tender. We're a juniper class cutter. There's 16 other uh, cutters like us uh, throughout the Coast Guard. Uh, we're one of nine other, eight other boats in the lakes. Um, the Hollyhocks will be leaving this summer after being here for 20 years. That's one reason we're doing this tour right now. Um, it showed up here and was commissioned in 2003. Built in Wisconsin and been here its entire time. We only left the Great Lakes one time and that was when we went on a patrol to the Atlantic Ocean two years ago and in uh, response for her unit. Um, so when the Hollyhock leaves, it's going to go into what we call a dry dock period. The boat's going to get uh, completely retrofitted and repaired, uh, updated and modernized. Uh, the boats have a 20-year shelf life. After it's gone, gone through that midlife process, it's going to go to Honolulu, Hawaii. That'll be its new home port. Uh, the Coast Guard Cutter Sequoia will be coming here from Guam. It'll do the exact same process we are. Uh, right now it's actually stuck in Hawaii, uh, undergoing some repairs to get to dry dock in Baltimore. Uh, it, our accompaniment is 48 personnel. We have seven officers and 41 enlisted, male and female crew. Uh, while we're underway, we do live on the boat. Uh, there are uh, racks from anywhere from six-man berthing up to single-man berthing, and the captain has his own stateroom for obvious reasons, right? Um, so our, like uh, Stephen Newton was saying, our main job is Aton, which is setting buoys. And um, if you look right out there, you can see a buoy sitting out there. Uh, we do that using a couple different tools. So we have our crane, which is capable of lifting 40,000 pounds. Our in-haul winch, which is capable of 16,500 pounds lifting capacity. And then our four, if you look on the four corners, we have our cross decks. Those are about 10,000 pounds each. And we mainly use those to kind of shift some stuff around the deck and to make sure that the buoys aren't swinging out too far when we lift them up out of the water. Um, typical evolution, we lift the buoy out of the water, we bring it onto the deck, we use some gripe chains to secure it to the deck, so that way we can move about it safely and not worry about it rolling or anything, because these buoys can weigh upwards of 8,000 pounds. Um, so when we get it set on the deck, we secure it down, we'll break the buoy from the chain, and we call it break the buoy. We'll hook it up to this in-haul here, we'll use this in-haul. You see the smaller chain, that's what's actually uh, installed on the uh, in-haul winch. That big chain is what is what we use to put it down at the bottom. So a shot of that big chain is 90 feet of chain, and that's about our average set, about 90 feet. You can go anywhere from 60 feet upwards all the way to 130 feet is I think one of our deepest buoys. Uh, the deepest buoy I've ever set was a NOAA buoy. We did it in Lake Superior. It was a 960 foot drop. It took about, what do you think, probably about 20 minutes to drop that buoy all the way down? Yeah, it took a while when you lower it down. It took a while because the in-haul's only got one speed setting, so it doesn't really go faster or slower, it just kind of does what it's supposed to do, right? Um, so our secondary mission is going to be ice breaking. Uh, we are an ice-capable vessel. We're not great at it, but we can do it. Um, it's our main mission set. We can break up to about 36 inches of hard-packed ice. Uh, when the ice is slushy, we can actually break uh, a little bit less. Uh, same thing as when you guys are walking through slushy snow and it kind of sticks to your boots, sticks to your car, same thing. It sticks to the bow of a boat, it makes us go a little bit slower, a little bit harder to break snows, right? And it gets a nice slush layer on top of that ice, makes it a little bit more compact, a little bit more valuable, right? Uh, what else? Uh, Commander Bricky is our CO. Been here for about a year. He's pretty good at that. Uh, we have an engineering officer right behind us. Uh, he's the one who makes sure that the boat runs at all times and stays running. Um, 
We can do all the missions the Coast Guard has. So we just typically stay in our lane and just do ATON. Um, but we can do law enforcement. We can do search and rescue. Um, we are we have a drone, so we check the box for the air mission right there. Um, so we can pretty much do anything that we need to. A couple questions I've gotten in the past are how uh, big is uh, Canadian migrants? Are they a problem? They're not a problem. The Canadians like the uh, like Canada more than they like the U.S. <laughs> Pretty easy for them to get across, right? So, yep. Yeah, so, are there any questions? No. Yeah. What's up, sir? Um, do you have the, is it an apprenticeship program? I know the other Coast Guard station they have sort of uh, cadets who come on and as they're selecting what okay. spec they want to do. They okay. So the question was, do we have an apprenticeship program? Um, kind of. So every year we'll get uh, academy students. Um, so the Coast Guard has its own academy when it comes to officers, and some of the officers will go through the academy rather than going OCS route. Um, so the academy grads are, every summer, they're kind of shipped out to different units and do different job assignments, get them some experience out in the fleet, what the Coast Guard's actually like. Uh, so I think this past year we got two cadets, one cadet. Uh, we've had two in the past. Uh, so they come on for four to six weeks, sail with us, see what we're all about, and then they head on and do their own thing. Oh, okay. So, but that's, How about non-commissioned? Uh, no, Nothing no, like typically, that. no. Not that I've seen here. Okay. Then they do program okay. other, or other units have, but here that's not something. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so this time I'm gonna ask, we're gonna go up this ladder wall, right in the middle, and go all the way back to the fan tail. Uh, please watch your step. There is some shifty spots on the deck. I fall enough on the deck, let me be the only one that you guys keep a firm footing. Uh, rule kind of rule of thumb is one hand for you, one hand for the boat as you're uh, heading up the ladder well, okay? And uh, with kids, take as much time as you need. I'm gonna be here all day long. Yeah, I'll be here all day long. So don't rush at all, okay? So if we just head right up here, Mr. Smith is heading that way. This is where we kind of come and hang out. You can see that underneath this tarp, there's a grill. There's a little trigger over here. This is the cooks use, some of the things they use to help make some food here. Um, it's good most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. Uh, we've got three cooks on board. Uh, one CS1 and two third, kind of apprenticing under him and you know, figuring out how to cook the first car. A little bit different than just cooking for yourself. You know, many times they're cooking from anywhere from four people four portions up to 40, 50 portions. So we do, we're underway, we do lunch, dinner, breakfast, and we also do what's called mid-rats. So if you have a late watch, let's say like a 12 to 4 watch, you don't have to be up until 10 o'clock so you don't eat breakfast. So the way the Coast Guard uh, makes sure you get an extra meal is they serve mid-rats. So they can be anywhere. I've had, I've had poke bowls, nachos, corn dogs, 
it's fried and greasy, it's probably served for mid rats. <laughs> And you, you can get that at any time. Uh, no, not any time. They typically it's, they do it from about 10:30 to 11:30 because uh, the watches yeah, shift. Yeah, at night. So the yeah. watches shift because if you have watch from 12 to 4, your watch starts at 11:30, and you're supposed to be ready at 11:50, right? Um, just to make sure nobody's late for their watch. Um, all right. So right up above this shoulder is our Aton boat. Um, so that's the boat we're gonna take out. Not every every buoy we work needs to be pulled out of the water. Some of them need to just have their lights checked, some of them need to just have a serial number checked or be position checked. Um, so we can use a small boat for that. Some of the advantages of doing that is that the cutter can actually continue moving on down the river or wherever we're working to the next aid. It typically takes us anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes to work one buoy. Uh, 20 minutes in the low end once the crew is seasoned and qualified and experienced. 40 minutes when people are just starting out, right? Uh, we only do it twice a year. Um, so a little bit of rust sets in in between doing things. Um, but we can go ahead and shoot down the river, work a couple more aids, and then the cutter can continue along. It basically allows us to multiply our work moves. Um, so we, that's what that boat's primary mission is. The boat over here is our uh, cutter boat large. That's the boat that we're going to use to do search and rescue missions, our training, um, any sort of... Uh, SAR response, any sort of law enforcement, that's the boat that we're going to use. It typically takes us, we train anywhere from five to seven minutes from the time we get the call to the time that that boat's in the water, engines are going, and we're shooting off. Um, so it's pretty quick, but we want to be careful because there is inherent risk when you're taking a boat and lowering it 20, 30 feet into the water. So it's not always a calm sea state like it is now. Sometimes we have more up to four foot of sea state when we're dropping this boat in the water before it really just becomes not, you know, reasonable and uh, too risky to do. Um, so that's uh, right at uh, that white building, or white room is our incinerator room. So when the Coast Guard built this boat, we had to have a way to get rid of our trash. But some of these boats are underway for upwards of six to eight weeks. Um, and that's without pulling into any ports. So the Coast Guard said we'll do an incinerator room. We used to actually burn all of our trash. Now, since laws have changed and regulations have changed, so we no longer do that. So that's one of the things that's going to be retrofitted during uh, the midlife period, that's going to be coming out. Uh, are there any more questions? So it really depends. It's got a, uh, it can hold up to 10 people, um, but typically we only take two to three people out at a time. So a coxswain, the person who drives the boat, a crewman, and then an engineer. So I hold the crewman and engineer sit. So I pretty much am always on the boat, which is a blessing and a curse all at the same time when I'm trying to sleep. But we do what we have to get the mission. Hopefully we're getting more people in here and we're getting more people trained. Uh, Coast Guard's only got 44,000 people. So everybody has one specific job. My job is an MK, I'm an engineer. Um, so I work on the engines, I work on the generators, I work on AC systems, potable water, uh, galley, making sure all that equipment runs. Pretty much anything other than the boat driving uh, falls under my purview and my responsibility. But I also hold calls as a uh, rigger, so I work on the Aton deck. Um, I hold calls as a small boat engineer, small boat crewman, um, and several other calls. Uh, import EOW, underway EOW, which is where I engineer the watch. Um, I'm basically responsible today for the entire boat and any malfunctions that may happen on it. I'm the one that's to respond first. Um, and so everybody has different qualifications and has to be, you know, kind of jack small trades because of our limited numbers on the side. And then after that, we're really gonna focus on getting everything off of the boat and basically stripping it down to the bare minimum sailing requirements. That way we can make the journey uh, to Baltimore. Oh, so this is just kind of a, a good time when we have, you know, a little bit of downtime to do this. Yeah. So a little okay. early, but we're not leaving right now. Okay. We got some time to watch it go in and out yet, but I'm sure it'll be publicized when we're gonna be actually departing and stuff. Anybody else? Awesome. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to head up this ladder well. You're going to take a right and go up the next ladder well, and we're going to follow that around on the right side. We're actually going to go into the branch. Uh, you can follow Seaman Newton. He'll uh, help guide us up here. Yep.
got a lot of equipment. You've got people that control everything in here at one time? Yeah, so when we're underway, there's continuously someone up here driving, someone working the helm, and then a couple other various people. I'm an engineer, so I don't really know the ins and outs of what goes on over here. So what do you do with your job? I'm an electrician's mate. Okay. So I'm an engineer, and then anything electronically breaks or yeah, I take care of. Sweet. Sure. I'm going to leave you guys with the EM3 Bertrand. I'm a petty officer, third class. Um, you know, you guys for up here? This is kind of like our main control center. Uh, we have a personal home, and a fellowship. And uh, this is also like the launch of the town. We have a uh, few watch standards here. And uh, we kind of just make sure no alarms, bells, whistles sound off. That Anything could potentially be wrong with the boat. So that's going to be just casualties while we're still attaching the dock. But yeah, basically while we're underway, uh, we do home watch. So basically that's what I would do. But I still need to get more qualifications to be able to do it by myself. So I'm going to break in. So I'll be up here with the underwatch standards to make out. And basically what I'm doing is I'm listening for uh, the lookout to give me direction. Turning the boat to where it needs to go so that we don't put it in anything. Also, uh, we have our sound powered phone mechanisms up here. Right here. Um, this is in case if there were to be you know, a fire or an electrical casualty in the boat to where we cannot really uh, use any electricity. We use these. These are uh, all throughout the boat in our various different engineering spaces. It's older technology, so it doesn't really rely on power. It's just more like what it sound. It's and then we have this equip it to uh, channels. No, not really channels, but that's often where sound can come from. So when we're out on the lakes uh, driving the ship, they control from here, but whenever we are doing more health evolutions, pulling in or pulling out of uh, ports or docks, um, so for this side, since we're moored up on the port side of the ship, they will control it from the port uh, console. Um, if it was vice versa, then they can also steer the ship from that starboard console right over there. Just to be able for the person driving the ship to have a better view, um, safety-wise, that you don't hit anything. Better control. Um, yeah, that's about it. Just a lot, a lot of uh, bells and whistles and buttons up here. Yeah. But you got to know which buttons you're pushing. Yeah. <laughs> it could be really bad. You wouldn't so want me up many here. How stations does it take then to maneuver the boat? I mean, you have a first station here and over to the other side, or is it all from that panel? Or depends on who, which side we're mooring up. So, like, if we're where you're at, starboard side, we would use that console, and then we'll, that person will come in and use all okay. that stuff over there. Yeah. It only takes, you, only takes one console at a time, and you, they, from here they can shift controls to either that side, or shift controls to that side, or shift it back to the center. Okay. Um, just depending on um, the task I have. How fast can you go? Not very fast. Not very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve knots was slow. Fourteen is pushing. Fourteen point six. So not very fast. She's a, she's a slow girl. So when you get into the Coast Guard, you must have your, kind of your basic training 
and introduction, and then uh, like your electronics, and you must go to a lot of tech school. Yep, so after you get out of boot camp, um, we'll send you to your first unit. It'll be a non rate. Uh, that's when you just break in your basic either deck, um, deck seamanship or your fireman, you break in other engineering. Um, and then after that, it's up to the individual to choose if they want to do what rate they want to go. So if they become a fireman as a non-rate, that doesn't lock them into engineering for their whole career. They can become a bosun's mate or an operations specialist or a cook. So um, after that, you go to your A school, they teach you to rate, and then once you're rated, you sign to another unit, and from there, you can be um, assigned and go to various other tech schools to receive further training in your rate. Five months. Okay. Yeah. And you must get then um, the schooling on uh, all, all kinds of different systems. Um, the school's pretty, pretty basic. It covers um, th mostly things that you would find at units across the country. Okay. So it's uh, it doesn't really dive into all these um, various other components and everything. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, broad spectrum trainer, okay. just to give you a better understanding. And that's with everything. They teach you the basics, and then once you go to the unit is when you master your craft of whatever uh, yeah. unit you're at. That's basically it. So they teach you the basics, and then basically hands-on learning from there. Okay. Any other questions? Um, uh, where's your tour guide? Uh,